Hi everyone. Thanks for dropping in. I'm Brenda Murray from Studio 5060T and I'm chatting today with Oliver Holen. Oliver is an on-location sketcher and an instructor from Vienna, Austria. And uh, when not, Oliver was nine years old, he wanted to be a painter, a scientist, and a pirate. And three decades later, he holds a PhD and he illustrates for scientists. Welcome, Oliver. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I think today we'll talk about two aspects of those. I think we'll talk about drawing and the pirate aspect, which I think relates to traveling. <laughs> okay, the sense go. of freedom that, that conveys. Um, so I feel in times like those where we can't even step outside, why not flick through some old sketchbooks and rejoice um, past travels? And I had the good fortune to go traveling with my wife and my four-year-old son in November and December through Southeast Asia to Bali, um, Cambodia, and Thailand. And I set myself the task to make a sketchbook there to sort of record what I was seeing and keep myself entertained. And today, I, th I think I'd like to share some of those pages and invite any and all of your questions. I think. I don't have a big agenda today. I would just like to share some of the work and get as many of your questions answered as possible to, to help you stay creative and entertained in those times. Super, and so we've got um, some illustrations that I'm gonna pull up on the screen and I'll just make sure everybody is in the call who wants to be in the call, okay? And uh, let's see what we can show people. This is gonna be fun, believe me. Well, so this is sort of, you know, I feel a lot of the images that I've been that I've been able to do and that I do in general are done under limited time. You know, with a four year old, you only have got so much time at hand before he gets cranky or wants some other thing. And so every every image that I most of the images that I do usually start with one element and grow outwards. And I think the question then always is, and the, the trick is how to assemble elements that fit together and that you like to form a finished image of sorts. Right. So here I sort of um, combined that, that horse-drawn carriage with that guy who was blasting in his um, megaphone. Um, something about Bali. It might as well have been welcome to Bali. That was definitely his message to attract tourists. Yeah. And then next, bit, next to it, I put this scooter that was very prevalent in the, in that area. And then those old architecture in the back that is all over the place, those old... Um, right, yeah, they're sort of... Uh, so Beautiful, a, really so old uh, stone the, sculpture the, things. Yeah, so um, I, I try to get, rather than filling the whole page, I often try to get um, an interesting vignette going. So an assembly, assembling of elements that have an interesting shape altogether, rather than just filling the whole page with, with sort of square format. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one of those examples. Um, the question always is how, how much detail to put in and, and where to stop um, and how to move on. So um, it's th this beautiful. is beautiful. It's really one. beautiful, Oliver. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any questions, as I said, like any, any and all are welcome. Um, process anything goes. Um, yeah. So this is another. This is in Kuta in, in Bali. I, Kuta is by now a very crowded beach town. Um, I like it because it's good for surfing. <laughs> do you surf? Are you a surfer? I do. I do. Um, I. This is. I, if I could spend my time completely freely, I would surf and draw. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> That's all it takes. Maybe a drink in the evening and then that's good. Um, so then again, there's all this old architecture and all these old um, statues and things going on and it's overlaid with this huge amount of, of tourists that are pouring through the streets and this traffic that is going on. And I think I started with, the, with one of the figures in the middle um, initially and then, and then looked around how to grow that out to convey the sense of location, the sense of what I wanted to what I wanted to relay. And then, you know, these things then grow and it, it becomes the challenge of what to include and what to leave out and how to combine positive and negative space in an interesting way. So for right. example, you look at the tree on the lower left, it ends up pretty much in negative space and sort of defining the, the shape of the rest. Mm -hmm. 
We have um, some questions for you here, Oliver. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. So, um, um, so the question for Oliver is from Mar Marlene, and she says, uh, I always have trouble to decide when a sketch is finished. The longer I look, the more I add, and sometimes too much. When do you decide a sketch is done? Usually too late. <laughs> <laughs> the honest answer. Um, well, so this is a tricky one to answer because your, uh, your sense of what it should look like in the end is probably different from my sense of when it is finished. Um, I think once you start adding things without actually making any more progress in the image and just sort of feeling too comfortable at, you know, I, of just spending time on the image without actually doing anything, this is definitely when you want to stop. Right. That makes sense. So there comes this point when you feel when the, the tension is sort of fading because you don't make any more decisions and you're just sort of pushing paint around without any, without any aim. Mm -hmm. This is the thing when it's when it's time to finish. Nice. <laughs> for me, at least. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So, and I have a question for you here from um, Kat. She says, "I love all of his work, including his color palette. I'm just Thank wondering you. what a few of his favorite watercolor colors are, and maybe some go-to combinations like for shadow." Oh, for shadow. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me look at my watercolor palette. So in this body of work, actually, I've pushed myself because I feel like I go to the so similar colors over and over again. And as we might be able to see later on, I've, I've tried to color code the locations um, by using different combinations of colors in each location. So this um, that we've just seen is sort of violet and magenta um, toned in general. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do I like color-wise? I do like, I do like, in, I do like to definitely mix them together. Um, so let me answer answer that in a different way. I like to decide on one prominent color, if you will, one that sort of sets the tone, and then mix analogous colors in to sort of add some variety, okay. and add add more of those analogous colors and variants thereof in in additional layers. So that um, helps me to not get too too much of a fruit basket going when I don't want it. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Which is, for me, color is the hardest thing, to be honest. So my big recommendation is start with one or two colors and see how far you can get with those and only bring in really another, a different color if you need to, or if you really have a, a reason to do so. Right. Cool. All right. So um, we'll move on to the next question. So this, uh, so the next slide, this one is in Kuta. Is that also Bali? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll revisit that again later. Um, okay. What's next? I, it's, it's, as, uh, it's a little bit of a surprise for me as well, because I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall this sequence and what exactly we decided on. Yeah. Yes. So you see um, on, the, on the topic of color, the overall layout is maybe a little bit similar, but the color scheme is completely different. So this is in a different place. It's in Ubud, which is sort of a place in the middle of the island. And it's very known for yoga and finding yourself and those sort of things. Um, unfortunately, it's too well known by too many people by now. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a secret anymore. But I, you know, honestly, I don't mind that. From a sketching perspective, if there's more people, no worries. I like to draw busy scenes. And this is sort of at a place that we stayed at. And um, one thing that I like to do is also include words and narrative um, in one way or another. And so the, the guy at the bottom was sort of um, the receptionist or the owner perhaps even. And, and we had these, I wouldn't say problems, we had these issues with the room and I'm, I'm easy going about that. My wife is, my son, my son is happy if he has a bed. So he was very easy going as well. Uh, but, you know, there, there were problems with the light switch and the, tele, the toilet was running and you couldn't close the bathroom door. And I was just asking him, like, do you know about these things? And he was very affirmative that he knew about all these things, but um, was not conceding in that anything was wrong with that. What the, with <laughs> the things are. I, I, it's completely fine with me. You know, that was that sorted. But I thought it was, it, was, um, it made for a good inclusion as narrative in the, in the speech bubble here. It um, does. And you'll and never other, forget that moment. Yeah, and the other parts are sort of layered. We have these this architectural elements. Some are 
some are all, some of those huts and those buildings, um, and some are more detailed, like this um, this hanging bit on the left mm -hmm. that combines sort of to the sense of place without being literally just copying what you see, but taking from here and there and assembling it. Um, a little bit like what we talk about in that uh, ten tools thing. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, and again, you see there's there's yellow and green as as the basic colors, and then there's a little bit of of a of a sort of more sepia, uh, not sepia, burnt sienna or something as well on top, mm -hmm. and very little saturated red, just on that flower on the head of the guy, and that's that's all that's that's necessary. I feel like. <laughs> uh, Oliver, I have a question for you here from Jeff. He says, um, can you tell us about the pencils or pens you use and do you use markers or fountain pens? So I would love to use fountain pens, but to me they are too scratchy. So I sometimes I try them, but I don't, I like, I like when my pens are as fluid on the paper as possible. So I use those fine liners. Sometimes they are Faber Castell, Pitt Artist Pens, uh, any anything. I'm not picky about those. Like this thing, Faber Castell. What's that? It's also Faber Castell. Anything that's a fine liner and has sort of water and soluble ink um, is fine with me. Sometimes black. Most of the times black. Sometimes brown as well. Um, I also I use watercolors for the basic um, coloring, and then I use gray markers and I use felt tips um the gray markers to tone things down and push them back and mute them um and the the really bright markers sometimes to add accents so i feel like with watercolors you might get all like you know eternal fall <laughs> eternal autumn mm -hmm, yeah <laughs> but this is one of your problems um then bring in some of those other felt tip markers to add accents and if you feel like you always go, go for the bright red in the watercolor or the bright yellow and you feel like it's getting too much, then you can tone things down with gray quite nicely. They also have, I find that those different tools have different properties that I quite like. The watercolor, this sort of wishy-washy, wobbly, fluid um, feel and markers can have very strong and sharp, sharp edges. So you mm -hmm. can make very defined um, areas of value and color. So that goes together nicely in my mind. Cool. So where are we now? Haute cuisine in Ubud. So this is still in Ubud, um, same place that we've been. You see the same color scheme is applied, um, same color coding as I set myself the task. And so you have all these varungs, these little restaurants that are scattered throughout all the cities, all the villages, all the countryside. Um, and this one for me was particularly noteworthy because it was like standing on stilts, like this tower. And it was this little area on top connected to a bridge by a bridge to the street for people to, to enter. And I've, um, one thing that I like to do is sort of to emphasize things and to exaggerate even to make them more pronounced. So that the feeling here is that the tower is probably even taller than it, than it is in real life. Although some people have, um, maybe even Alexander here in the chat today, um, have commented that they remember, ex that they know exactly what place I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so um, I put that in, decided what to, what to focus on, which was this sort of high elevated little restaurant area. And I think then there's another thing that I quite like is some sort of graphic humor, if you, if you will. And so by calling that sort of haute cuisine, I feel like, um, you know, right. high um, food cooking, um, I feel like that complements it itself nicely. Um, it does. It's yeah. gorgeous. So um, I have a question for you, Oliver. Yes, please. Um, the watercolor first or the line first? Usually, 95% of the times it's the line first. Um, mainly because sometimes I, I, sometimes I even add watercolor only very much later. So I feel my strategy with all those pieces and usually with sketching as well is I want to be finished all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how much time I have a lot of time. So I want to be finished. So if I here, if I have the tower, for example, in line, then I know, okay, I can look for reference in other places and can finish that to some extent. I can right. look for color reference in different places. I can look for how those shadows should look in different different buildings perhaps 
but I know that the tower and that sort of on location thing that I really want to get out, I have, I have nailed down straight away. And then I can sort of embellish and develop further to a higher degree of finish. But even with the initial sketch, it is some sort of finish straight away in my Right. Opinion. And so if you've got that line down and you're adding the watercolor later, you are not coloring in the lines. You are just splashing it on there. A lot of times, especially here, it's sort of there's some sort of initial orange wash that gives a feeling and atmosphere. So if you have trouble with colors and you're using too many colors, perhaps, or your watercolors look a little bit, you know, too fruit basket for your for your taste, then it really helps to add an initial area of one color over over your image. Um, not necessarily everywhere, but give that make that the so if you want carrying layer of all the other colors, all the other colors that you apply on top will also be influenced by that color. So they cannot be as garish anymore, even if you try it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool. So I have a question for you here from uh, Don. He says, I've been to one of, you, of your workshops and loved it. And we, would love, <laughs> yeah, and we would love to organize another one, wouldn't we, Oliver? We have we plans. Would, would very much so. It's, it is sad times. I had a whole program set up and it all needs to be rescheduled. We have plans. We have big plans, don't we, for next year? We do. We do. We always have plans. Yes. So yeah. uh, anyway, so the question is, uh, I'm wondering what kind of wild and wonky sketching are you doing while you're stuck at home? Anything from around the house, from photos, or what's what are you doing these days? You know, I do I do I do things that are very different, to be honest. So if you if this is the style that you're in love with and that you associate with me, um, I do things that are very different right now. Um, I also do as I as you mentioned, Brent. I do illustration for scientists, and those pieces right. are usually higher, further developed. They go on covers of magazines and things like that. So I've been pushing um, some of my analog skills in that in that respect, and I um, can we can you can you show can you show me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So this is a, uh, maybe not a sketch. I don't know. This is um, a guy called Tyro. He is a British dude, and he found the first coronavirus. Wow. So uh, there we go. You see that they are more developed, those pieces. Yeah. But a lot of what I'm talking about um, to you about the sketches also apply here, only that then it becomes more refined and there's more layers and stuff on top. And uh, okay. Oliver, what, what, what have you done that sketch in? That's not a watercolor. It is watercolor, funnily enough. But it doesn't give that feeling. So what I like, um, without getting too much sidetracked, so first of all, I do again, Instead of the, the, the fine liner that we talked about here, I use color pencil, which sort of dissolves more when you apply color and it doesn't stay as prominent, but I can rely on my drawing skills, which are sort of a staple for me that I can rely on. And then with that very smooth hot press paper, I can put um, layers of watercolor on top and I can also lift out again. So um, are you saying is it a water, watercolor pencil? It's not a watercolor pencil. It's not meant to meant to disappear, but it does disappear over time. Anyway, it's a uh, it's a sideline. I don't know whether we want to get too much into that. <laughs> well, I, it's so amazing, and you're the only person I know who has drawn a coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, here here it goes. Yeah, and the, yeah. There's a little crown here. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, should we look at your next sketch? Absolutely, um, and please keep the questions coming. Good question. Yeah. yeah, and if people want to ask <coughs> questions, as I said before, you can uh, Facebook message me. So you find Brenda Murray, my Facebook profile, and, uh, and then in a private chat, you can send me the questions and I'm asking pretty much all the questions. But I definitely would like to go out and draw outside again. This is sort of, I, I don't, at home, I find, a little, I find it a little hard to be inspired. I feel like I've drawn everything out. And you know, a lot of times what I really am inspired by is people and the interactions and the stories that unfold when people interact or at least that I or that I um, project onto them and this is much harder at home you know yeah so that's true so where are we here um so here we are in uh Kangu also in Bali you see is another it's another um town on 
um, on the sea, another surf place to surf. <laughs> wow. And this is another one of those bar rooms. You see another, again, a different color scheme. It, it should feel very different than the Ubud one, which was green and yellow. And here we are going to reds, oranges and, and violets. And this is another one of those little restaurants. I could just draw those sort of things with people around all the time with the little signs. And, um, and you see that it, it again started here with um, line work initially and then develop, then adding color and developing the, the patterns and the individual identities of the shapes further. For example, you see those in the back on the right, that tree. Mm -hmm. um, you see those white acrylic lines. Yeah. It's a white acrylic marker that sort of li livens up the, that area a little bit and gives it a unique identity. And by that, it sort of stacks better. So the tree stacks better behind the behind the actual restaurant, and we we notice that because of that. Yeah. And so, so what you were saying about the fruit basket kind of result that you get if you're using every color in your palette. Yeah. So you're preferring I'm to just go with a couple of of colors and uh, to do the staining on it just with a couple of colors, complementary colors. Yeah, you know as. So this is not a this is not a judgment. I all all of that I'm all of what I'm re, what I'm relaying usually is about tools. Yeah. If you're unhappy with one thing, how can you how can you change that? Uh, how can you do this if that is what you want? Um, if you feel that your your pieces look too much like a fruit basket, and you you probably you're dipping your brush into all the colors in your palette and just smacking it on, and this can be temp this can be tempting and also this deceptively accurate because a lot of the time when we look outside we see something that has color all sorts of colors all over the place but you what what happens then is that even if you copy it exactly as is you might not like it because you might not like the reality either exactly as is mm -hmm. you know it wasn't designed to look good a lot of times it was just just something that people put there and went on. <laughs> well, that's true, isn't it? I mean, if you, you know, if you're having a house built and it's being designed and decorated inside, usually it's on a sort of monochromatic color scheme and it all goes together. But if you're doing a whole neighborhood, it's not like yeah, any, well, any person has said, oh, let's make sure that all the colors everywhere that you see are all going to blend nicely together. Exactly. And then you have a random car driving in and just happens to be a completely off color. I mean, this might be your point of emphasis that's completely fine but if you don't like that then don't focus on it as much you know don't you know, focus I, on the actual color as much it's brilliant actually <laughs> that point oliver i never really <laughs> thought about it that way before but you're absolutely right i mean there's nothing wrong with the colors in nature or the way things that you see but they weren't necessarily designed or the neighborhoods or cities weren't necessarily put together in a way that's a, a color scheme that is pleasant yes. Yes. yes, even. Especially with advertisements and, you know, all the yeah. human stuff that may or may not have been designed for the place it ends up in. That's a, an excellent point. Thank <laughs> you. I, well, I learned something. I, I never really thought about it that way before. So I have a so question for you from... This is definitely, color is for me one point where I depart reality and I'm happy to do that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I have a question for you here from Trent. He says, um, are you typically standing when you sketch or do you take the time and sit? And then I think the next question that onto that would be, you know, how long does it typically take you to, uh, to complete a sketch? So if I can sit, I like to sit. The most, so I'm an introvert, you know, believe it or not. I, if I can avoid people, I, I'm not there to, to make a show for people. So if I can just tuck away yeah. somewhere in a corner and draw without people noticing it too much, I, pre I always prefer that. If that means I stand against the wall, I'll stand against the wall. If there's a nice place to sit, I will sit. So, you know, I prefer to sit. And how long does it usually take for you to finish a sketch? It, it depends. So some of the ones that we've looked at, we're going to look at are taking longer this one maybe this one doesn't this one wasn't taking that long maybe all in all maybe that's an hour hour and a half maybe okay maybe less and uh, somebody here uh, is asking lydia but he, remember, um, just to finish that with a four-year-old you rarely have one hour at a time so 
yeah. put that again. Try to finish as quickly as possible and put the important bits in, know what you want to say, and then be content to look for other reference in other places. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Liddy Villard uh, from San Diego is asking, uh, she says you, you, you use fine liner, but what do you do with the blacks? How do you do those larger areas of black? Is that also with a fine liner? Um, it is. It, you can go back over, over with the fine liner or you can use a different kind of, let's see, different kind of tool, like a brush pen kind of thing to, to put some of that darker value in. Um, but, you know, what I definitely bring is a fine liner. Everything else, I'm, a brush pen I might have on me, but I might also not have on me. You can, you can achieve a lot with a fine liner. Oh, and hello, who do we have here? <laughs> Say hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's time to go to bed here, so that could be saying good night, right? <laughs> good night. Can you say good night? Good night. Good night. <laughs> Have a good sleep. <laughs> Sorry well, about that. No, that's, that's great. Nice to meet your son. Uh, so Renata is asking um, how you select your palette for a sketch. So um, did you pick, okay. in the last sketch, did you pick the red for the last sketch or how, you know, how did you decide on that? So it's a combination of two things. One is sort of how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Do I like it? Do I not like it? Usually if I like something, you know, there's certain colors that convey a positive emotion, others that are a little bit cooler or that make you, you know, blues and greens, they might put a little bit more distance between you and the subject. So one is the, how do I feel about it? And the second one is, what is the color actually there? If I, if I get, if I had to describe the scene in one color, what color would it be? Mm -hmm. There might be, you know, there might be this, this purple car and there might be a blue, whatever, and the green tree, but what's the overall, what's the overall sense that I get? And then out of those two things, I decide what the color is going to be. Okay, and, then cool. I, and then I vary based on that and see if it needs more because it gets too bland maybe or too boring, I bring in more colors. But they need to have a reason to come in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to be invited in. Exactly. <laughs> All, right. All right, so I'm going to pull up another image for you and uh, tell us about this one. <clears throat> this is uh, pretty much on the, same, on the same spot and this has a lot of people in it. And I... Um, it was sort of a, a Sunday gathering at the temple there and there's lots of stuff going on, lots of sounds, a little procession. And you see I've brought in those, um, those words, this wong, wong, wong sound um, lettering thing. And you see a lot of lost edges as well with that, that person in the, on the front left. He's not, he's not completed which sort of makes it more interesting sometimes than if you put it exactly there, like a, like a silhouette, the complete silhouette. So yeah. don't feel compelled to put in everything all the time. Also then the guy next to him who's sort of walking away, who we see the back of, mm -hmm. you see his shirt and his, um, his bottom meat, there is no line. There is, it just sort of fades into nothing, right? Yeah. And that can add, add a lot of interest. We, we read the, the figure nevertheless, yeah. and our brain um, sort of completes those lines. So if you, if you can, or if you feel like your figures are too static or too boring, perhaps, try to see what you can get away with without completing them fully. That's an excellent point. I have a Especially question for you. Yes. I have a question for you here from Sandra Biscup, and she says, greetings from Urban Sketchers Vienna. So shout out to Urban Sketchers Vienna. Yay! <laughs> I miss you guys. Yeah. She says, uh, do you sometimes start a sketch and come back to it later, or do you work further on your sketches back home? Um, I'm not dogmatic. Any, I will have done anything at some stage. So, for example, the some of the Kuta ones in the beginning, if I cannot finish it in one, you know, I start somewhere and I feel like, oh, this is interesting to put in. And then I realize, well, now it's just a piece of something on the page and it's not finished at all. So maybe it needs more stuff and I'm not in the same place anymore. So then sometimes I go back to that place and see, look for other things that I can put in to, to finish that. And the color, if I have a sort of general sense of color that I want to convey, 
I will allow myself to to play with color at home and not do it on location. I I it just takes a lot of time to do to do color work properly on location. And then you have, you know, you have this huge setup which might not be might not be useful for for your for your sketch at the time. If you're in the middle of people or if you're somewhere where you need to move on or where you can't bring water or where it takes too long to dry, um, I will I will not do it on location. Right, right. Huh. Cool. So where are we here in this new sketch? <clears throat> we are we're back to CUDA and this is um this was on a sort of unfortunate fortunate day for drawing. I really like that sketch, but an unfortunate day for me I had sort of an ear infection. And oh. that I couldn't hear anymore in one year, and I had to call a doctor and had it looked at. And he he took care of that, but I couldn't go into the water, or do anything, no surfing for a few days. And so I was just hanging out by the pool and assembling the scene of, of people as they were going through their day, sort of. Right. And I again, I've condensed things. I've seen those things on location. All those people I've seen there but they were not at any given time in that proximity and they were not um, as densely packed. But this sort of conveys the, the essence of what was going on much more, I feel. And I've also allowed myself the thing that I sometimes, that I quite often actually do is this sort of Frankenstein method of combining people. Yeah. So if you have the important bit down of one person, then you can take bits and pieces of other people to fill in the, the rest. <laughs> and that sort of relaxes that, that relaxes me and gives me more time to to add in more detail about um, people and I'm also happy to some things are heard like this this lady when she was talking about where they go to an Italian place and she was just rambling on about what's about uh, self-important stuff or what, what they were going to do and things like that and um, other people other things I would just project onto like there was this other lady next to her sitting down and looking in her purse and she it felt like she was really agitated about looking something so I would just um you know I would just project onto her that oh where did I put my passport so yeah. to convey that sense of what it is so I'm 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 easy that way I sketching is for me a prime source also to entertain myself to sort of get <laughs> information in from outside and digest that and do something with it that entertains me and that uh, that gives me a good time yeah yeah <laughs> So uh, I notice, uh, you know, I, I notice sometimes when you look at different, uh, the artwork of different sketchers, some of them, they have, um, they really cleaned it up. They cleaned up the sketch. They took out anything that made the sketch look messy, like anything that they are looking at, they, they cleaned it right up and it's a pristine looking ideal kind of environment. So if you stepped into that sketch, you'd feel like, wow, I'm in the perfect town, you know, but in your case, um, <laughs> and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I sort of feel like in your case, you are making things like a little bit shabbier. The, the uh, you know, the, the bodies are like a little bit um, lumpier and, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, the sidewalks are a little bit more crooked than they might be in reality. Is that true? Are you exaggerating slightly in that direction? I do. Um, I do because... It's fine. You know, once you have, I feel like once you have some some skills down, the question is what? Why bother? You know, yeah. what 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 is it actually that you? What, what enter? Why do you draw, and what do you want to to do with it? And for me, it is um, getting to some sort of essence of what I think the place is about. And I don't I don't see beauty in the world. <laughs> I mean, I do see beauty, but it's not something that attracts me. I, I'm not interested in drawing the most beautiful statue or something i want to see like what's the oh, there's something a little weird going on and this is unique and unusual and this is a little funny this is sort of the things that that speak to me and you will find what speaks to you and it might be very different even with the same skill sets um, our pictures our sketches might be completely different just by what speaks to us right cool <clears throat> and so you just make things like a little bit you're exaggerating in a way that's a and it's funny too to, even if it's buildings and other things, I'm trying to give them character, something that makes them, yeah, a little bit more visceral, perhaps. Cool. All right, I'm gonna to move to the next slide and also ask you a question. This is from Pat. 
And she says, when looking at a new scene, do you tend to begin with one or two horizontal or vertical lines or do you start with some eye-catching shapes? Um, you know, to be honest, a lot of times <laughs> for those sort of things that I do on location, I rarely, hmm. well, sometimes I, I start with a sort of layout. Sometimes I do what one is supposed to do and start with a sort of shapes layout and think about what it's all going to look like. I do that especially if I'm if I'm particular about a specific thing that I really want to capture in a certain way and I have a lot of time. Yeah. In reality, a lot of times what happens is that I just start somewhere and have it have things grow outside. So I start with, with something that attracts me or with an idea like in this in this case that we're looking at it was it is the interaction of two people and the idea that somehow in this modern world what everyone's looking at looking for at the beach is internet yeah. <laughs> this is sort of you know it's a distilled um, version of a day spent on the beach where you see like what is what are people doing what are their problems what is going on and and internet was the sort of the wi-fi was sort of a prevalent prevalent thing and then i would with that idea in mind, Wi-Fi, internet, people are struggling with that on the beach. How could I depict that? Yeah. Taking elements from that spot and arranging them in a way that um, sort of convey that essence. So here we have this guy who says, no, he, I, he can't get internet. Um, and she, she's asking, how's the reception now? Do you get any signal? And he says, nope. nope. And sort of you know, put, pushing it a little bit by sort of having her readjust her, her bra. Yeah, um, was doing, but not in that context necessarily. But it sort of makes the makes the point a little bit more prominent, even. So, as I said, I, I'm happy to entertain myself anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, so uh, somebody's asking. Trent is asking. He says, "I don't. I see you don't include any color in the sky. Um, is that a deliberate, or do you sometimes?" Um, so, you know, I'm scared of blue skies. Maybe that's one thing to say. Why This would be because it can be, become very dominant. If I had now a very blue sky here, then the contrast between the blue and the green tree, they, you know, it would, be, it would become a di distraction from the people, I feel. Yeah. So that does not mean that I couldn't have used a, a lighter sky. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But bright... Um, intense colored skies, I often shy away from, but I have I have done them as well. Um, okay, cool. Where are I'm we really, here in this sketch? I'm really conscious about, you know, color and value, like how dark and how colorful things are, are one of the prime methods for you to steer and direct the eye. So be careful where you put the darkest values and the most intense color. <clears throat> Sorry. So we're, um, here we are in Malaysia and Cambodia. So here we were moving from Bali, you see the plane on the left, um, touching down in Malaysia and flying on to Cambodia. Um, and you know, this is a, a sketch made out of those in-between moments at the airport where you don't know what to do and you see people hanging out and, and, and um, I sketched some of those people and those scenes as you go through security, which sort of gave me a little extra kick, you know, how. I feel like people, you don't do that normally, and I'm not even sure whether whether they'd like you to do that, but I was standing behind the column and sort of peeking out. And, <laughs> and they didn't mind, eh? I, I know in security, you dare not pull out your your phone or your camera, because... Yeah, I wasn't doing that. Okay. Uh, Edge book might be, a, might be a gray area, who knows? Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's and cool. Then I sort of color coded again sticking to one palette on the top and another palette on the bottom to sort of separate those two things yeah. a little bit. I'm cool. confident feeling that, you know, you go from one place to the next. Yeah. Cambodia, yes, Angkor Wat, which is sort of the big attraction in Cambodia, those temple, these huge temples spread out. And what we see here is um, a way of dealing with the overall shape of a spread. So you have this double page spread and the a lot of times you don't have, or I don't have enough motivation or time or um, even an idea of what to put as one big image that goes over both, both sides. Mm -hmm. And so you can help yourself, or I help myself a lot, but just 
breaking it down into smaller sections and then seeing what emerges over time. It makes it more manageable and you can you can easier complete the task rather than setting yourself to task. So I have a double page spread and 10 minutes, let's fill that. You know? <laughs> yeah, so you're saying that you started uh, and you did part of it and then you added some later? I started, so the top, the one on the top right, when we're going on this tuk-tuk, this, um, this um, scooter mm -hmm. carrying that carriage, Yeah. Uh, I was drawing that thing on that tuk-tuk and I didn't know where it was going to go. You know, the whole sketch, I had no idea. I thought, okay, let's, let's draw that one thing and we'll figure out the overall architecture of the sketch later on. And mm -hmm. sometimes this breaks the ice because you've sort of put something on the page and you have something to work with and rub against and, and, and develop off from. And sometimes it's just scary because you, you know, you sit on this tuk-tuk thing and you feel, now I'm ruining my page, now I'm ruining my page. <laughs> And so then the other little little panels I added over time, and then in the end I had some some time to do a larger thing at the bottom. Um, yeah. And the trick then is to find a way of connecting it, connecting it so that it overlays and feels natural and organic that they, they go together. Again, limited color palette, a little bit of writing. Um, yeah. So Oliver, do you feel like you are a loose sketcher or do you feel like you're a tight sketcher. Do you know what I mean? Um, to me, it looks like a really loose style, loose sketching. Yeah. Not too concerned about things, but but I know that you are have a scientific mind. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think I am loose, but not careless. Okay. <laughs> so I. I think I, I I try to keep my pen loose and allow mistakes, but I sort of have a have a desired endpoint with any with every line in mind. So I'm not just scribbling and seeing what happens, you know, yeah. waiting for something that emerge out of the darkness. Right. Um, but I'm I'm okay with um, accidents that happen and opportunities that arise in that way. I like also the balance between the sort of looseness and tightness and chaos and order. If that makes sense. So what is the size of this sketchbook that we're looking at? Um, well, can you Yeah. Can you show my screen? This is sort of the size. Okay, the so is that like eight and a half by eleven when you close it? Um, it's a little bit more I think it's a little smaller than that. Okay, and then you're using the smooth uh Paper. This one is a yeah. This one is a smooth hot, hot pressed um, Stillman and Burn Seda, I guess. Or Beta Seda. I'm writing this down. I, I'm taking notes from everyone I, <laughs> well, I <have laughs> everyone I interview. Sketches. You know, I've done in this one is uh, completely different. This is more eight and a half by eleven, um, and it is more sort of paper slightly. So. Cool. And there's sketches on both in both um, in both of those books in the in today's yeah. lives. Cool. Okay, yeah. Here we go. So, oh, I just wanted to ask you one thing. Well, it, it seems to me that it all your pen work almost looks like it is a fountain pen. So, um, first of all, what is the size of pen, like the nib size that you're typically using. And are you going over these lines a second time to make them thicker in some places so that you have that thin, thick line, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. So the thickness, um, I use a 0.3 or 0.4 or 0.5. That's sort of the range that I use. I don't like too thin and I don't like too thick for that format. I will not go back all my lines to correct something. So if I've made a mistake, so to speak, I live with that and, and elaborate on that. But I will go back over the lines to make them thicker and give a little bit of that fountain pen feel. So that yeah. line, the variety of line, if you make it um, thicker in areas, they will come forward or they will look more 3D or um, give it more dimensionality. I will do that when, when I think it's useful. But mm -hmm. this will be a second step without, and I'm very careful to not 
to not compromise the initial line work that I've done. So if you make a line, you know, a weird funky line, then I try to not in the next step make a straight line instead of it, but just to sort of follow that outline that I've made and um, underlate the width, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think sometimes when things are imperfect, that's where the charm is in a sketch, yeah. in my opinion. So for yeah. example, in the middle of your sketch here, there's a circle. And the circle is not a perfect circle. Yeah. But yeah. if it were, it would be far less charming. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of, this is the handmade quality of it. And I think yeah. a lot of the charm, as you say, it comes from giving your best effort and embracing the little failures that happen along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you want to tell us about this sketch? Um, yes, of course. Uh, Angkor Wat, more temples. There's temples and temples and temples everywhere. And those are all little vignettes of parts of those temples and either of the temples themselves, or we have this sort of little chicken running around. This sort of, it's also, I think it's usually a good idea to not just focus on the main story. If, the, if your main sketch is temples, also look and include some minor actors, if you will. If you see some animals crawling around or some people, like there's this lady, and and at the time it seemed like these Aladdin Aladdin pants were were the rage. Everyone everyone was wearing them there. So those little observations, if you can put them in, they add all the character and make it really your sketch rather than just any um, sketch of a bunch of temples. Um, there's a little juice cellar on the bottom. So it's a spread that's that's combined all of observations um, in that temple area with some details, some larger larger areas um, cool. yeah and again color color is very restricted to two green and um, orangey um, tuk tuk we talked about tuk tuks they they are the mode of transportation there they, they bring you everywhere and I just you know again graphic humor that is this sort of don't stop and park here sign on the right and uh, that's where they stop and park and to leave you off I just, I just love that shit. This is what I, this is, I could, I could draw things like that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. Really. And then, um, this is also one of, an example of where I use the same element and iteratively put it on the page over and over in different, in different ways, similar to what we have in the online, in the online workshop where we use one thing and fill the page with something that by itself might not be as interesting. But if you put it enough of times there and with little changes, it becomes it becomes almost like a pattern yeah. and interesting sketch. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Bangkok, um, Thailand. So this was um, done on a on a boat trip along the canals, and you know you go on a on a fast boat and you try to put down a sketch and capture what's happening. So I was making these little things left and right, and in the end try to figure out the way of make it appear as if that river was sort of in the middle connecting it all. And that sort of worked. It's not one view and there's not enough time to make one view, but you can at any given time, you know, you, you take a house on the left and you take a house on the right and you take a boat that you see and you combine it into sort of a pleasing arrangement and you yeah. hope for the best. <laughs> and I remember you covered some of these things that, that you're illustrating here in your tips in your online workshop uh, design mm -hmm. on the fly. And mm -hmm. this was one of the tips and um, it, this, this example isn't included in the, in the video, but I remember um, talking about overlapping and so on. And yeah. So I if people, no, no. If, I'll just let people know that if you're interested, uh, Oliver has an online workshop that's available and it's called Design on the Fly. And you can find out more information about it at www.studio56boutique.com. So, yeah, a lot of the things that we covered in that workshop I use over and over in those sketches. Um, yeah. It doesn't talk about color and um, exactly how you should draw, but like how to arrange these things. A lot of the tips that are, that are in there, I feel like I use just all the time, I, I notice and realize. Um, this is one, this is a larger one. When people ask like, how long does it take? This is one of the large that, that took the long, the longest time to do. And was sort of down from a, from a, from a house in Bangkok. Khao San is one of those tourist areas. It's not very appealing, but you know, lots of stuff to sketch. Um, and it's a little, 
a little worn down that whole area, but I love that stuff to sketch at least. And wow. I was finished, I was doing that over maybe three or four hours on two days, um, sitting by the pool and watching down. Wow. And, and sketching that. So I love all the things, the details that you've included. And, you know, even just these little spots on the, on the ground, on the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if it's stones or if it's just little marks that you make on the ground. I think yeah. those, just those little marks really add a lot to the sketch. It really helps to, to give certain patterns to your shapes to make them read as something different, give them a different identity. You see, if it was a different pattern on the ground, it would also work. It might read as something else. So if you want to convey stones, then of course those circles are a good choice. But even just having an, having a pattern that's different from the rest will sort of help with, with it reading as something different. Yeah. Yeah. And so a reminder to people, uh, we're coming close to the end of our, our chat together. So if you would like to um, ask some questions, you can send them to me through Brenda Murray's Facebook uh, profile. Find me on Facebook and send it in a Facebook um, message. Okay. And uh, Fred, if you wouldn't mind to turn off your um, camera, that would be great. There we go. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next slide for you. Oh, where are we here? Another Bangkok sketch. And I, I think this one, this one lives from the, uh, again, from the unusual perspective and from the fading out in places. So again, a, a strong silhouette because of it. And we're looking down onto people and onto, onto that road. And you see that the edges of, there's a high, there's areas of high contrast and lots of detail, and then they fade out into nothing. I think that that gives it a lot of mystery and, and, and appeal in my mind. Yeah, cool. <laughs> wow, and so you're using framing, a lot of framing here. I do. If I do smaller, um, if I do smaller pieces, and then framing is a good, is a good device to give them some unity. Um, one trick that as soon as you put things into frames, it will start to be read as a story. Yeah. Um, I think we're so conditioned by comics and things like that, that if we have a few frames, then our mind um, jumps into narrative mode. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that can be exploited by, by all the sketchers out there. And here's again, you know, a day on the beach and there was this um, on the top right, you see that dog and there was this swing on the tree. And there wasn't much else happening on that on that beach. And it's sort of behind that tree and behind that swing there was the sun setting usually and it was just people just thought it was the perfect spot to take a picture and instagramming everyone was talking about oh let's get on there and let's take a picture and stuff like that so i was trying to capture all the varieties of people and and situations that were happening on that swing so the swing by itself you know would be a poor subject i think to sketch and poor, but with all those little people and the little vignettes and the little stories of what they are what they're doing what they're how they sit on like the first on the top left um you see yeah. the hand actually takes the picture of that that girl that's looking into the sunset and below we have another one who's who's talking to his um his, his girlfriend and um tries to you know position himself as best as possible and and some of them swing uh and then you know i sometimes pushed them things to extremes again. There was this couple where he wasn't the most um, tech savvy and she was very interested in having a picture taken for Instagram. And so I, I, I made this up in the end that, it's, uh, that she was saying like, this is a radio, Hans-Jürgen, it's, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a phone. Yeah. So, you know, the combination of these things, again, keeps me endlessly entertained. Um, yeah. And I mean, you have to sketch for yourself, number one, right? You're not really we're not performing for other people when we sketch in our sketchbooks it's a personal thing so you should enjoy well, yourself even if yes and even if you did it for other people they also want to be entertained usually so this is the i feel the number one complaint that i perhaps have um about about that i hear of people's sketches is that they say oh why is it so boring and they usually it is boring because you are not trying to make any point so yeah. if you try to make some point, and usually it's easiest to make a point that appeals to you, then other people will also find it and uh, will also be able to relate to it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same point. It can be very different points. It can be about beauty. It can be about scary. It can be scary. But some, or an emotion, or a story, or um, anything. Yeah. But it's usually something that you that if it's relatable, then we we like it. I think you know at the bare the fundamentally when we're doing an urban sketch, um, even if there's no point to it whatsoever, it's always good practice to just draw something. But um, you're right. I think um, the more interesting sketches are the ones that have a focal point or they're actually, uh, there's, there's something about it. You're telling a story, there's a story that's evident right away. Um, or it's obviously, you know, the, the artists had some fun when they were doing it, like with the swing. You're having fun watching all these people and all the crazy things that they do on a swing. Um, yeah. So those are the more interesting sketches, aren't they? I think there's two kinds of sketches. There are sketches that, you know, that you make of a place to relate something. And there are sketches that you do to hone your skills. Yeah. And if, you, if it's a sketch that you just do, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's great. If you just do that, don't expect it to be appreciated. You know, it's, it's, it's your practice. I have tons yeah. of things, but they don't need, you know, you don't need to, they don't, that's just a sketch. You learn something. Yeah. It's good. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right that's right it's just sort of a practice sketch exactly there's nothing wrong it's for people i mean this is not this is not to offend anyone but they're not necessarily the ones that you know need to be liked by other people i have so many sketches that will never say the light of that will never come out of the drawer because i was just trying something and it, it sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't yeah yeah that's right Cool. So uh, some, someone is asking uh, if you're going to be publishing another book, please, the person says. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you? I mean, I, I'm looking at these, I'm thinking, well, there's definitely the theme here of, of your uh, Asian travels through Malaysia and Cambodia and, and uh, Indonesia. Is there a book in the works? Um, with those sketches, there's not a book in the works. And the I would love to. The hard part is always the marketing, to be honest. To be quite honest, it's not the putting together, it's not doing the work. It's uh, about having it seen by enough people that it that the effort is um, justified, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, books are it's very tough. tough. If anyone's out there has a way of um, overcoming that hurdle, or has a, you know, if you have a publishing company or something like that, get in touch, absolutely. I'm all, all, all game for that. Yeah. Um, so with that work, that's that. There are other, there are two, uh, definitely one other thing, one other book thing, book project that um, is in the works that I can talk about and one other that's also in the early stages. But they are less, um, well, they have, they have different focus than to that. So I'm, yeah. I'm working on that. If you can help with any of that, um, I'm all, I'm all for publishing, I'm all for books. I love them. <laughs> um, I know I saw you gave me a copy actually of your book uh, or maybe I purchased it I forget um, that you did when you were um, going down the the river yeah, in Amazon. yeah down the Amazon yeah. yeah what was it called again um, no road in no road out right um, do you have a copy there um, I don't have a copy on me at the moment um, it's still on it's still on Amazon funnily enough yeah <laughs> the book on Amazon on Amazon um, and it sort of was a reportage um, story where I traveled on that that river and um, relayed the experiences at the time. It, it was sort of was a finalist for an award at the time. It was was good fun. I would there's some things that I would I, I like it. It was a good push for me. Now there's some things that I would definitely do, do different, but um, I'm still fond of it. Yeah, cool. So tell us about this waterfall here. <clears throat> so this is something I, where, I, where I knew I just have to do this as well because I rarely ever draw nature and I've, this was just a challenge for me to approach it and, and do it and go in and draw natural elements and it started again not as you see it now, it started with the waterfall in the back um, and then there were people, people around like this is one figure in the pool and this other figure that looks like weirdly heroic standing on top. And then it was some, I, I decided it needed more because it wasn't, um, it wasn't enough yet. So I wanted to have some more natural elements around. And then I have this huge tree in the foreground, which is something 
if you ever try to do that, it's sometimes a scary thing to do, to put a very dark shape um, in the foreground. And this is something that I just tried to do here. And I think it, it worked out. I realized that in the end that it was a little blunt and I sort of was looking for something that could liven things up and put it those but put those butterflies in. And I think altogether it sort of works. But you see again, I didn't have this grand view of designing this the scene ahead of time because I didn't know how much time I was going to have. And I was sort of starting with the waterfall. We were there, we had some time and then going from there and deciding what the, the, the sketch needed as it was evolving. Well, I think that the tree is actually framing it really nicely, but it also yeah. is a different probably kind of tree from what you would see where most of our viewers are, are watching from. So it kind of says something about the place. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes. Cool. All right. Move on. Okay. We're so, coming to the end of our sketches here. There's two more guys, so hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Again, something that I very rarely do. I very rarely oh. just go a building without people, I feel. This is, um, yeah, just something that I, I really do because I, I like the, the human element in things. But this was a was a temple in Thailand, in Koh Chang. And I was really intrigued by those, as you can probably tell, those ornaments on it. And I really wanted to play them up. And I think I succeeded in that and make it a little, the whole the whole temple. I made it a little smaller than it would be in real, um, in reality. Played up the ornaments, made them a little bigger, but so that they are still believable. So you could still imagine that it just about looks like that. And this is also one of the examples where I sort of mapped out the building, to come back to the question earlier, to map, where I mapped out the, the building a little bit ahead of time with a with a pencil to know sort of where the front and the the, back, uh, the the left edge and the right edge would be and how high it would be and things like that. Cool. So cool. All right, we'll move on to the next one. And if anybody has any questions, if any final questions, you should probably uh, send them to me now through Facebook. Find Brenda Murray on Facebook and then send me in a in a private message, and I'll be asking Oliver. Where are we here? <laughs> Last one. This is a market in Bangkok, um, Chat to Chat Market. And I was sitting in a little coffee stall and I had all these people like coming my way. And it's a big market, um, one of the biggest in Asia. And people were packed with, with their shopping bags. And um, I just, I was just um, intrigued by, by how much was going on and just, um, did my Frankenstein method to assemble people and and convey that scene as it was happening. Um, again, a very simple color scheme with with um, purple and, um, and rose and and a little bit of yellow in the bottoms, the bottom part. Cool. To sort of not too monotonous. Yeah. So cool. So as I mentioned, everyone, um, Oliver has uh, an online workshop called Design on the Fly, and. Um, and uh, this is available through www.studio5062.com. And uh, if you go there, you're, you have unlimited access to his uh, online workshop. But also, there's something else there called a premium package. And Oliver, do you want to explain to them a little bit of what the premium package is all about? Well, premium packages, sometimes you can, if you take a video class, a video workshop, it can leave you wondering like how, how exactly to solve the problems that you have. You've done the exercise, but you maybe you're not 100% sure how it turned out or how to get the final touch. And the premium workshop gives you access to one-on-one -on -one time with me where we go over any and all questions you might have. We talk about your sketches. We, we talk about any, any problems that you might have. Cool. And so they find out about that uh, online workshop by going to www.studio66boutique.com and click on the pull down menu called online workshops. And we filmed that workshop when we were together at an in-person workshop in Vienna. And we had a wonderful time learning all about Vienna. It was great. Um, so everyone uh, also, uh, Oliver has another idea that he would like to present um, about uh, creating an in-person, not an in-person, you know what, maybe Oliver, you should explain. Well, so those of you, um, those of you who are looking for diversion right now, or those of you who really want to skill up right now because they have time on their hands and want to use that opportunity, and I, I do that definitely as well, 
um, I'm thinking how to best help you with a workshop. Um, we've been pondering a few ideas and one idea that we are having is to, to do a, a live stream workshop where I perhaps present um, an angle and content that I haven't presented other, otherwise before. Um, this will be limited to, we don't know, but not maybe 10, 20 people, something like that. There would be a, definitely an interactive element in that. Access, um, access to me, perhaps some homework. It would be maybe two, two sessions, maybe three. We're still working on that. Um, if you would like to give any feedback about that, would you be interested in that, or what would you exactly be interested? What what would you be what would you be wanting to learn right now? Um, I'm I'm here to listen to you. Um, any feedback is valuable feedback. It's much better than just produce for into and leave it out in the world into the black hole. <laughs> um, so if you want to get in touch. Definitely send me an email at um, hollaoliver at gmail.com. That's H O E L L E R O L I V E R at gmail.com. Also, if you want to stay in the loop about anything that's coming up, um, I can add you to my email list. Um, I hope to see many of you, and any feed feedback, as I said, um, is very welcome. No pressure. Super. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, so, everyone, our next, my next live streaming interview is going to be with Stephanie Bauer next Saturday, April 18th at 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And I'm going to be talking with Stephanie. If you don't know her, she's a Seattle-based watercolorist and uh, architectural illustrator. She's wonderful, does beautiful, beautiful work. And we're going to be talking uh, with her next Saturday. And the, da the date and name of all upcoming uh, guests on these live streaming interviews will be posted at the www.studio66boutique.com. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It'll be posted on the Facebook page for Studio 56 Boutique. And these video, these live streaming interviews are recorded into videos and are going to be posted on the Facebook page. And uh, all and uh, available on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to watch it later, you'll be able to do that. Um, I want to thank everybody, and especially Oliver, for popping in today. Oliver, do you have some final words? Well, I hope it was useful for all of you guys, um, at least at least parts of it, or some of it. Um, thanks for showing up. Um, thanks for listening to me. And I hope to see you all in... In the real world soon again. You yeah, know, at an in-person workshop. That's what we yeah. want to do next yes. year. Next year for sure. That'd be great. Yes, absolutely. Super. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed our chat. And um, take care and take care of yourselves and your families. And better days are on the horizon. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Brandon. Bye. Bye. Bye.